Hello, and welcome to chapter one of The Poor Historian's The True Makwahuit Aztec Combat Manual. Chapter one will be covering the equipment and weaponry used for conducting this interpretation of Aztec martial arts. Uh, so this chapter will be the least active chapter out of all the app chapters in this manual. Uh, however, it is full of necessary and prerequisite information about the equipment that you will be using for this martial arts. So, uh, to start things off, an introduction to the weapon of the Aztec culture. This. This weapon is known as a makwahuit. Uh, it is also known as a makana. Uh, to clarify the differences between the names, the makwahuit is the standard traditional name for this weapon in the Aztec language of Nahuatl. Uh, however, the Makana also comes from the conquest as well. The word Makana was originally encountered by the Spanish conquistadors uh, from the Taino culture and other uh, nearby and similar island cultures to describe a similar yet uh, still very different weapon. The true Makana is actually more of a club, more of a long, heavy, and completely wooden weapon uh, as opposed to the Makohuit, which you will see later on, has a few more components to it. However, the Spaniards, who were already familiar with the Makana uh, in their conquests and colonizing of the islands around Central America, gave that name to the Makohuit when they first encountered it after going to the mainland. Uh, and also to clarify, Nahuatl is not an easy language to understand from a Latin perspective, uh, and so a lot of the spelling uh, can be a little confusing. Specifically, Makwahuit does look like it sounds like Makwahuitl with an L at the end. However, the L is kind of pronounced silently. Uh, I've heard it described as being like saying the word Atlantis without uh, antis, uh, the TL of that, etl. Uh, so, to continue on, there are a lot of questions about this particular weapon. One of the biggest questions is, what were the specifications? What were the dimensions of it? And the answer to that is, we don't know. Uh, there were so many different variations uh, on the Makohuit that you can see in the images. There was one surviving Makohuit that survived the... the uh, the conquest and the colonization uh, and the centuries since then. Uh, however, that was burned in a fire in the Royal Armories in Madrid in the late 1800s. Uh, and they actually didn't record too many details about it. We were left with what is essentially a sketch of it. Uh, so there are a lot of details. There are some, there are a lot of details we don't know. There are some conquistador accounts that can list the Makohuit as up to three feet long. However, you can see from a lot of the pictorial evidence that they can actually be much shorter. Uh, we just don't know the details. One of the, this kind of relates to one of the very common topics of discussion about the Makohuit, and that is, is the Makohuit more akin to a sword or a club? Um, the standard weapon is that it has, or the standard description is that it has traits of both, but as you get into this interpretation of Aztec martial arts, you'll actually find out that it has many more similarities to a club as opposed to a sword, or at least to club combat as opposed to sword combat. And that's something that you'll see in later chapters. Um, however, this is unique, of, unique enough of a weapon to simply be classified in its own world, uh, not as one or the other. Uh, one of the details that we really are not sure about is how thick the Makohuit actually were. Uh, we, we really have no idea. We know that they were thick enough to add these blades into the sides, which we'll discuss in a little bit, um, but we don't know how thick those blades were, and we don't know uh, how much excess was added on to either promote or dissuade extra weight from it. <clears throat> one other topic of clarification comes in this handle. Uh, does this, if you look at this handle, first impression, it looks like it is a two-handed weapon. When in reality, um, when you look at the images, the surviving images from the, from the era, almost none of them 
are depicting a two-handed weapon. Now you do see a makohit with this handle length. Uh, this is authentic and appropriate for the era where it looks like it could have two hands on it. However, none, and, and then also, in addition to that, you see images of Makohi with a standard single-handed weapon grip where the blades extend down to about here. However, even in both of those styles of weapons with the extended grip or the shortened grip, they are always wielded with one hand. The Makohi is not a two-handed weapon. Out of the, all the months of research and the hundreds and hundreds of images that I've encountered showing and depicting Aztec warriors, even in combat, wielding Makana, I have only ever encountered one image that shows a Makana being wielded in two hands, and that even is not in a combat scenario. It's more of what, what appears to be a coup de grace uh, depiction. So, for the sake of this manual, uh, and based on the historical sources, the Makana is only a one-handed weapon. Um, so what does that mean? What, we, we do have this long handle, but if it's a one-handed weapon, why? Well, we will cover that in more detail in chapter two. Uh, for now, I want to go into a little bit more details about the Makohui. One of the other things to clarify is this bulb at the end. Uh, we, again, don't know too much details about it. Um, we are not sure if it was left flat like this one was or if it actually was a three-dimensional spherical shape uh, similar to the pommels of Europe. Though, of course, there are disc pommels in Europe as well. Uh, nonetheless, this is often referred to as a counterweight. Um, however, if you look at this weapon, this weapon was not made for finesse. This weapon was not made... Uh, for tactics and defensiveness, this was made for aggression and weight. And so this is often not, or I would interpret this as not being a counterweight. Uh, even so, even in addition to that, if you would look at this weapon, this counterweight, I'm sorry, this bulb at the end, is made out of the same material that the rest of the weapon is, aside from these stones that would be here. This, even if it were a three-dimensional sphere and had that extra weight on there, it is nowhere near heavy enough to act as a proper counterweight for this weapon. What is a more appropriate interpretation is that this bulb at the end was used to prevent your hands from sliding off if you're doing a heavy attack, sliding off the end there. Uh, it is known that some of these weapons do have a hole in the middle of this bulb at the end, um, either used to hold a strap, which would then be attached around the warrior's wrist, or possibly to uh, be used for hanging and storage in the armories of the Aztec cities. Um, but the final note on that is that this is not used as a counterweight, as it is frequently depicted as. Um, so this weapon, as you may have noticed, is completely made out of wood. That is because this is what is known as a waster, a training makohuit. If this were an authentic makohuit, if you would look at this, these, you can see that it has these little raised sections here on the side. These are made to represent the blades that the Aztecs would have used, which would be made out of a volcanic glass stone that is called obsidian. Now, obsidian is very cool. Uh, when it is napped and brought to a point, it has a sharper, finer edge than any steel sword could possibly get, including the uh, swords that the conquistadors used when they uh, attacked and conquered the Aztec Empire. What does that mean? Well, it means that these weapons possibly had better ability of cutting through skin or cloth armor as the Aztecs did have. However, it, does, it is a double-edged sword, uh, because the, while these are sharper, they are immensely brittle. Very, very brittle. Meaning that after one or two attacks with the Makohui, your obsidian would be dull or chipped or flaked and essentially making the blade aspect of this uh, unusable. Now, it does still have weight behind it, so you could still attack with it, um, but it does only have a couple hits. So that leads to the next section of... Is the Makuhuit a two, or I'm sorry, um, a double-sided weapon in the standard European sense? Well, if you really think about it, there are no depictions of the Aztecs in a specifically um, 
in, in a pose or an attack, specifically using, for lack of a better term, the false edge, which would be the edge of a blade that is facing you as you're wielding it. There are very few depictions that could be interpreted as that. So it is very likely that the Aztecs would, instead of using the false edge as you would in traditional European swordsmanship, they would use it in the same manner that a, for example, a lumberjack would be carrying a double bit or two-headed axe out into the woods as he is cutting down trees. You could use a single bit axe, but as you're chopping down trees all day, that blade becomes dull. And so you could waste time or spend time sharpening that one single blade and then getting back to work. But if you were being, um, if you were being a hard worker or if you were being efficient, what you would do is instead of sharpening that one blade, you would simply flip it around and there you then have another fresh blade ready to go. That is likely the reason why the Makwahuit is a two-sided weapon, not so it could be using uh, a false edge as is familiar with European swordsmanship, um, but in actuality so that as you are wasting one side of the obsidian, you could simply flip it around and use the other side. Uh, that also brings into another concept comparing it to European swordsmanship is the concept of getting into a bind. While well, obsidian is a very fragile stone, it is very likely that the Aztec warriors would not have used the blade to initiate a bind. Now, I'm not saying they wouldn't have blocked with it in a, in a desperation attempt to prevent, you know, getting hit by, one of, by your opponent's makuhuit. But they would not have done attacks that would have initiated the bind, meaning intentionally hit your opponent's makuhuit to then maneuver around it. That just is a way of destroying and ruining your makuhuit. One last topic of clarification is the idea of thrusting with the makuhuit. There are depictions of a makuhuit with an obsidian blade pointing out the top, which would imply that thrusting was a, a concept and a legitimate useful skill for some makuhuit. However, there are many, many depictions that don't have a tip, and I believe that that was intentional. Because with Aztec uh, hierarchy in the military orders, you actually rise through the ranks by bringing in captives from the battlefield. And it's very likely that a thrust to the head, which if we were interpreting this Aztec martial art properly, you would only use thrusts to the head, would initiate uh, a concussion or a daze or something that would allow you to then take advantage of your wounded opponent, keeping them alive and bringing them to uh, the central pyramid or other religious place for sacrifice to then rise through the ranks of the Aztec military yourself. I believe that thrusting, at least to the head only, is a very legitimate and important part of Aztec martial arts. A couple minor notes. There are very, there are almost no variations from this general shape of the makuhit. I've seen a lot of depictions showing a curved makuhit, or sometimes a more clubbish makuhit with giant pieces of obsidian sticking out, progressively getting smaller. Those are very cool looking, um, but when it comes to historical use, the Aztec obsidian, very likely due to their fragility, was kept very short and very close to the wooden part of the blade to prevent any unnecessary chipping or breaking when traveling or even in combat as well. However, one important note with Aztec martial arts is that this is not a manual exclusive of the Chimali, or of the Makuhit, but it is actually one used in conjunction with another piece of Aztec equipment, their shield, also known as a Chimali. Few notes on the Chimali. Um, one, before I forget anything, the Aztec, I wanted to clarify, the Aztec Makuhit is always, always used in conjunction with a chamali. Always. A lot of the Aztec chamalis, uh, most of them actually, are depicted with some sort of artistic design on the front of it. Uh, many of those symbols actually are, are universal, meaning you see the same symbol on the chamali across the many, many different source material that we have on Aztec culture, meaning that there were a set amount of designs, or at least in, in theory, that the Aztecs would use on their chamali. What did they mean? We don't know. We're really not sure what those Aztec symbols meant, but we do know, we do have some interpretations. 
I don't want to get into that right now because I don't think it relates too much to um, this interpretation of Aztec martial arts, but it is a very fascinating topic to discuss um, and also to explore yourself. There are various types of chamali that are there. There is um, the Otla chamali, there's the Yao chamali. Now what we know is that these chamali, the, the different uh, names, the nomenclature for the different types of chamali means that there are clear distinctions between types of chamali. The only problem is we don't know what they mean. <laughs> what you should take from that is that just like the Makohuit with the chamali, there is not a set dimension, there is not a set shape for the shields that the Aztecs would use. Um, there is a few description of the of unique chamales. One of the uh, common ones is a description showing that a chamale could actually be taken apart and rolled up into a roll for carrying and travel, then unrolled and locked into place again for combat. Now that's very important because it relates to another uh, topic that we'll get into in a second. But I do want to clarify one other aspect that is frequently seen with chamali is that they actually have straps uh, of loose material hanging down off of the bottom of the shield. A lot of the times they are thick and colorful. Uh, sometimes they've been interpreted as different material, frequently leather. Um, but more often than not, they're actually made out of feathers. Now, even leather straps and feathers, uh, they have been interpreted by various historians that the straps were made to prevent arrows or other projectiles from getting through. Personally, I don't think that those little straps hanging down would have done too much to defend. What I believe is that they are actually used in conjunction with a lot of the other aspects of the shield, such as the bright color um, and, the, and the ability to at least roll it up or the concept that a thin shield existed is that these shields, unlike traditional European shields where they are used primarily for blocking, the Aztec chamali is traditionally used for screening. If you have this out in front of your opponent with the straps dangling down, they can't see very much. And as you'll see in later chapters, there are various stances where you're holding the makohuit behind you, even more so preventing your opponent from seeing what you are doing. A last note about the chamali. If you look at the back of this, even though it is made out of plywood, the design is in, uh, inspired by one of the few existing chamali uh, that is held in a museum overseas. Uh, the idea is, take a look at these straps here, they are made out of leather. You can use this chamali either in the standard um, rotella style, where you're strapped to your arm, or, as seen in some images in the sources, you can actually hold it like a buckler. Very fascinating because this is a very utilitarian shield in that you could decide, at least before the battle starts, it's very difficult to swap between the two mid-combat, whether you wanted to fight buckler style or strapped style. Um, I may get into a video later on, uh, adding a, a supplemental chapter to describe how buckler combat would work. But for now, we are assuming that, most, as most of the images depict, that this combat would be with a strapped shield style. The Makuhuit and the Chamali, used in conjunction, is the foundation of this interpretation of Aztec martial arts. Just know that there is, that is, that is the basics of what I wanted to cover for information, the, the prerequisites, if you will, for understanding this interpretation of Aztec martial arts. Just know that there is so much more depth when it comes to the Makohuit and the Chamali, the designs, the shapes, the quality, uh, the colors, even, when it comes to their connection to Aztec society, social hierarchy, religion, and so much more. I don't want to get into it um, because I could write an entire book on that topic, and I want to get to the more active chapters, which will begin in chapter two of this manual. Thank you. This has been chapter one of the Poor Historian's Aztec Combat Manual, The True Makohuit.